in theory, um, you're not going to die from like over shopping. Right, you know right, I mean? right. You might end up hopefully not homeless or in debt. Right. You might. That would then qualify you as sort of acute. I do think that it's important for me to kind of clarify the shopping thing was more so whenever I was in like college that that was a really like mm -hmm. my kind of impulsive trait. But then the more and more it was the drinking, something that's like in a lot of ways more problematic because of how that like physically affects you. I, I had seen my body literally deteriorate um, because of it. And how bad was the drinking for you? It was pretty, like, it was, was pretty your... bad. Like there was a time where I was drinking like a bottle of wine a night, which just to put things in perspective, women are in one day are not supposed to like, it's like three drinks and a bottle of wine is five. And so to do five standard drinks, like every day, I was drinking way too much. And it was to a point where like my blood pressure was out of whack, like GI type stuff, like um, bleeding, like it, obviously it's a depressant like it makes you really really depressed um a lot of weight gain we have this idea that self-destruction is you know suicide att suicide attempts that end you up in a hospital or like cutting to where it's obvious but it's like me drinking alone in my apartment deteriorating my body it still has repercussions you know what i mean sure. and they also have the statistics of bpd that people like um we're more likely to die by unintentional suicide and so when people just kind of say like oh they're borderline whatever whatever like that person may eventually actually kill themselves and also I feel like if a person is concerned in their own behavior that should also as providers be a tip-off because like we're probably not telling you all the truth like everybody knows that you know what i mean because it's embarrassing like i'm being very very candid now but i, I th but i'm not gonna lie it's possibly easier for me to be more candid because i do have those stereotypical um benchmarks of success like i have a medical degree i, I have my own apartment like it's really hard to be super super candid so if a person is telling you that they're worried about themselves you should be worried for them what prompted you to stop drink? Are you drinking still? I What's do. Your relationship to alcohol now? I do drink, but as an addiction psychiatrist, I do believe in harm reduction. I do think that there's a spectrum, but I also think that, you know, your treatment goals have to be in line with where you're at. For instance, I have like, I don't keep alcohol in my house and I don't drink when I'm sad. I don't drink when I'm alone. Like, so those are harm reduction tactics. Whereas if I was like, oh, I'm never going to drink at all, then I wouldn't allow myself to like drink in like public celebratory settings versus like, I have like a no drinking when you're sad because that just is never going to go well ever. <laughs> right. I liked pot. Pot was my drug of choice. Um, something I had learned in treatment is if you're using it as an avoidance strategy, you rob yourself of an opportunity to have the feelings you need to have and you need to have those feelings to properly guide your decision making. Like over time, okay, so you go a little off course today, but if you keep doing that, you've gone like really off course. Just out of curiosity as you being like someone who's sort of specialized in right. this. When is it like, yeah, this person is not a harm reduction person. This person is a like, you've got to fully AA it and you know, you can't harm reduce. Right, right. Like every time you drink, it is harmful for you. How do you make that gauge? as a treater. Yeah. So just like everything else in mental health, you have a diagnosis that has criteria associated with it. And so it's really funny because whenever I looked through the criteria for alcohol use disorder, I thought back to my past and I was like, holy shit, like I definitely qualified for severe alcohol use disorder. Physically, are you making things worse? Are you able to function in your job and your responsibilities? Are you affecting your relationships with other people? Are you able to engage in hobbies are you using more than you um wanted to use are you having trouble um cutting down for me though it was kind of like even though i qualified for the criteria of history of um severe alcohol use disorder and um you know i have depression and anxiety for me the 
diagnosis that was really driving everything was the BPD. Because mm -hmm. what you said was just so eloquently put, using a substance was so that you weren't feeling certain emotions, but if you're not feeling those certain emotions and not learning how to tackle and tolerate them and alter your behaviors, then that is like the one of the main issues. And I'm also gonna use Charlotte as an example, just because I feel like the three of us are so different. You know, she had these instances of binge drinking and blacking out, but it was never when she was alone. It was always whenever she was around other people. And so so whenever her and Lois were talking, there was kind of that hypothesis that, oh wait, I'm drinking because I feel really, really, really uncomfortable in social situations. And so it was kind of like, she kind of really understood her relationship with alcohol as related to her interpersonal relationships, emotional dysregulation. I think that like the bottom line is the most important thing is to figure out why you're using the substance because people use substances for so many different reasons reasons like people have this mentality of oh they're using it to get high but like no actually maybe a person's using it because they have serious trauma that has never been addressed maybe they're using it because of abuse maybe they're using it because of untreated depression anxiety maybe they're using it because they're in a domestic violence situation so it's like if it unless you tackle those things then whether or not a person uses alcohol, like obviously that's an issue, but I feel like the real issue is this. So whenever I started paying attention to like the aspects of my mental health that were really, really the source of everything, like it was the fire and not the smoke, then I think that that just subsequently, um, like, you know, changed my relationship with alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so I think, yeah. I think that when you talk to your provider, it's just really trying as hard as possible to be as open and honest as possible possible to like the reasons for your use what is good about using that's what I always ask my patients but let me oh that's a good question what is good about it because yeah. people don't expect that they're like oh my god my doctor asked me what what's good because they're so used to us judging and being like it's all bad but it's like what is the good thing right. of your use and if you say the good aspect of your use is you can tolerate being around other people or you can tolerate your relationship that gives you more of an idea of like the things that need to right. be addressed you know as someone who had had an eating disorder for several years, um, you know, I got better from behavior through CBT. And I knew when I got better that I was still mystified by its origins. Um, and then other problems cropped up because, because the origins hadn't, hadn't been really uncovered. And that was when I was like, something else is going on. They're obviously related, but you know, something else is going on and whatever was the treatment for the eating disorder didn't do, didn't touch this at all. And that was sort of the personality disorder stuff. But I'm just curious, like for people watching this, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, because I do think people can use harm right. reduction as a way to justify doing the drug. Right, you know? right, 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 right. So like, how do you catch yourself to know if you're that person? I will, first of all, usually whenever people in treatment, at least at the facilities that I've worked at, everybody starts off with abstinence. So usually at the very minimum, a time of sobriety is pretty, pretty imperative. You know, there are patients that I've had that it's just not a possibility. Um, and, you know, that's unfortunately why we have um, therapists and day programs and why we have certain medications to help, you know, because everybody really does have a different path. And it doesn't mm -hmm. mean that there is something wrong with you just because your treatment plan is different. And I know me saying like, oh, yeah, like I, uh, I still do drink. But at the same time, I really, really, really had to seriously change and do and like get treatment in order to be to this point so I don't want it to come across as me frivolously saying that like from the get-go you can just start with harm reduction it's definitely something that's very right, I see you know I think another thing is that like paying attention to not only like the the reasons for use but also paying attention to how we uh 
comments about our use and how like the commentary mm -hmm. that we give ourselves sometimes people may be like well i only use on the weekends but then it's like okay you're only using on the weekends but then you're unable to have a relationship with your family um you're unable to do the things that you're really passionate about you're you know physically you're hung over the next day staying in bed and you know so it's like right. the, what is the impact on your life and being as honest as possible because it's like, um, we're not here to say like, never use substances because that would just be super hypocritical. But for me, the purpose, like Marshall Linehan said, is like living a life that's worth living. And like, is this the life that you want to be living is like kind of the ultimate question.